Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of our very special webinar series, which is community focused. Uh, it's about COVID, and we hope it's going to be an opportunity to engage with our community and answer questions and address topics of relevance and interest. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands in which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. Very happy to welcome tonight Andrea Grimes and Vanessa Spark, who are going to be the panelists. I will be the person giving them questions and asking for clarification. Next slide, please. If you have any questions that aren't answered as we go through the, the uh, webinar, if you could use your little Q&A um, button at the, at the bottom middle of your screen there, just type up a question and uh, I will give it to the panelists and ask them to answer it. Next slide, please. We hand over to Vanessa. So Vanessa, if you'd like to unmute yourself and off you go. Thank you, Peter Ann. Okay, so what, what is the coronavirus? Well, coronavirus is a name given to one of roughly 14 viruses that we know of. The term coronavirus was given to this type of virus due to the projections that can be seen on the surface of the virus that look like crowns, thus the term corona. Now, coronaviruses already exist in humans and animals, and you might be surprised to know that 15% of common colds are actually caused by a coronavirus. The other well-known human coronaviruses are SARS, which caused an epidemic in 2002 and 2003, and the lesser known MERS, which is a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which caused an outbreak in the Middle East in 2012. All of these coronaviruses cause respiratory symptoms similar to the common cold, uh, including a cough, a feeling of tiredness and slight fever, with some variances including sore throat, shortness of breath, and some people also experience diarrhea. And with, in animals, this, uh, sorry, and with symptoms being similar to influenza, which is um, a completely different type of virus, by the way, uh, and also rhinovirus, which is the other cause of the common cold, it can be hard to differentiate between them and thus the importance of testing. In animals, this type of virus has been around for years and it's found in cats, dogs, bir birds, bats, pigs, mice and many more. COVID-19 is actually called a novel coronavirus because this particular strain of coronavirus has never been found in humans before, which means our immune system does not recognise it at all, unlike the human influenza. And therefore, we can't mount an immune response to it. Because this is a novel virus, we are learning something new about it every day. And whilst health officials aren't 100% sure where it came from, this is the likely scenario. The source was a fresh animal produce market, most likely the fresh fish market in Wuhan, Hubei province, China. So the first infected cases that we know of were people who worked in the markets. An animal was the source of the virus, which was then transferred to humans. And it's important to note that viruses can pass from animals to humans, such as the Hendra virus and rabies. However, because viruses are specific to the host, that is, the specific animal that they've come from, or specific to the human, if it's a human coronavirus, they rarely cause the same symptoms in both animals and humans. The next cases who presented with the same signs and symptoms had not been near the market, but had been in contact with people who had, which led doctors to believe that the virus was now transmissible between humans. So for this coronavirus to be transmitted from one infected person to another non-infected person, it needed to undergo a mutation or change. And this is what it did, which made it highly transmissible between humans. So how infectious Vanessa, is that? Sorry, Vanessa, sorry to interrupt. We've had a request, not a question, a request. If you could perhaps use your outside voice rather than your well brought up voice, there's that people are having a little bit difficulty hearing you clearly. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, sorry. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So to put that in some sort of context with mumps, one infected person is likely to infect 10 non-immune people 
And with measles, which is airborne as opposed to droplet, one infected person is likely to infect 18 other non-immune people. So that's to put it into context as to how infectious this is actually is. Next slide, please. So how is it spread? Well, like influenza and the common cold, COVID-19 is spread via respiratory droplets from an infected person. So when an infected person coughs or sneezes, the respiratory droplets, which are quite large, can only be projected about one metre before gravity takes hold and they fall to the floor. And this probably only takes about a second. Of course, if an infected person was sitting at a table, then the droplets would fall onto the table. And if an infected person was standing within one metre of a packet of Zenith 10 gauge 16 millimetre galvanised hex head metal screws in Bunnings, then the droplets would land on the packet. So if a non-infected person was to walk past an infected person at exactly the same time that they coughed or sneezed, and the infected person does not practice cough etiquette, that is cover their nose and mouth when they cough or sneeze or sneeze into the inside of their elbow, then the non-infected person could breathe in the viral droplets directly. And this is what we call direct transmission. But let's go back to Bunnings and back to the fixing aisles. If the infected person did indeed cough whilst looking at the packet of screws, and the droplets landed on the packet and every packet around it, or if the infected person did in fact cover their mouth when they coughed, but they used their open hand and then went and picked up the packet of screws, decide they didn't want the packet of screws and then put it down again, then the respiratory secretions containing the viral particles are now on the surface of the packet. So the non-infected person comes along picks up the packet of screws, takes it to the counter. The Bunnings staff member also picks up the packet of screws, zaps it, and then they both go out and buy a sausage and lick their fingers after buying the sausage. Then they can, can become infected. And this is called indirect transmission. In infection control terms, we call the packet of screws a fomite, which is an inanimate object that is capable of harboring an infectious agent long enough for it to be transmitted. Just as a side note, when, well, while some people experience diarrhea as part of their symptoms, there is yet no real evidence that shows that COVID-19 is spread through feces, urine or blood. Next slide, please. So how long does it stay around? Well, we can't answer this question uh, exactly for COVID-19 because we're doing studies all the time as we go along. However, from other forms of human coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS, the virus can probably persist on surfaces such as metal, glass and plastic for up to several days and some people say even up to seven to nine days. But we don't know that the virus stays infection, infectious for that whole time, however. A recent study was undertaken in a laboratory environment that looked at the survival of COVID-19 on different types of surfaces and compared this with the SARS coronavirus. So the surfaces included plastic, stainless steel, copper and cardboard, and they also tested aerosols as well. And what they found was that the virus was more stable on plastic and stainless steel than on copper and cardboard which means the virus is viable on plastic and stainless steel for about 72 hours or up to 72 hours. Whereas on copper, it only lasted four hours and in cardboard, it only lasted up to 24 hours. So Vanessa, this is really interesting, isn't it? Because we're talking about infection control within the home. And obviously we have lots of plastic and stainless steel, don't we, within our homes? Absolutely, we do. Too much probably. <laughs> And Andrea was actually going to talk about that a little bit later on. Thank you. Um, but there are two big buts to this, however. Firstly, the virus's viability or survival declines over time. 
which means that while the virus may survive on plastic and stainless steel for up to 72 hours, it probably reaches its maximum uh, viability or livability at about seven to eight hours and then declines rapidly after that. And the second but is that it all depends on the viral load or the amount of virus the infected person has in their respiratory tract at the time they cough or sneeze. So the more virus they have, the more that, that that will be expectorated or spat out and the more it's likely to be passed on either directly or indirectly. So go on. Can I come back to, I've had a very interesting question, which I think does come up quite a lot. And the person saying is that they completely understand the need not to touch our faces. What they are saying is that when you lick your fingers, it's not so much of a problem because it goes into the GI tract and stomach you know, acids will sort it out and it's not really passed that way. So why the prohibition on licking fingers? Obviously this person says it's better not to lick your fingers overall, but why would that be a route of transmission? Okay, so it is it is a very good question. So um, mucous membranes, so our uh, mouth or our oropharynx and our nasopharynx, whilst when we uh, eat something and we swallow, the majority of what we've eaten goes into our stomachs. Uh, not all of it will, and some of it will remain on the inside of our mouth, so particularly around our tonsils um, and our uvula, which is that little hanging down thing. Um, so, and then when you breathe in, so if you breathe in suddenly, there is a, because we do breathe in and out our mouth, there is a possibility that that virus can then end up in our respiratory tract. And I, and I imagine this may well be due to what you were just saying, viral load. So if you've had a big viral load, so if someone gave an enormous cough over that packet of screws from Bunnings, and then, and so you've got quite a lot on your hands, potentially you might have a quite a big viral load that would be available there. That's correct. Yes. Or, yeah, or as right. someone has just said, if you lick your fingers, be sure to breathe in through your nose and not through your mouth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if we just quickly go back to Bunnings and the plastic packaging for the screws, if the infected person who coughs on the packet of screws has a high viral load, then the virus will likely survive on that plastic up to 72 hours, but be really at its peak at about eight hours. This means that there's a high transmission via the plastic. But if the viral load of the person was low, which means when they cough, there's only a small amount of virus landing on the packet of screws, then it's likely that there will be less virus and potentially it will have a shorter life. Next slide, please. So I'm, why is hand hygiene so important? I'm just gonna tell you a short but sad story about Ignaz Semmelweis. So back in 1846, a Hungarian doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis was working in the maternity clinic at the General Hospital in Vienna. And like so many of his colleagues, he was beginning to disbelieve the theory of miasma. And the theory of miasma is that the air, the bad air causes disease. And he was taking an increased interest in anatomical causes of disease. And so this resulted in an increased number of autopsies and also an increased interest in data collection. So Semmelweis was particularly interested in the reasons why so many women in the maternity ward were dying of uh, childbed fever or puerperal fever. So he looked at the two maternity wards in the hospital. One was staffed by female midwives and the other was staffed by all male doctors and medical students. And when he looked at the numbers, he discovered that the women in the ward staffed by doctors and, uh, and medical students were dying at a rate of nearly five times higher than the women who were having their babies in the midwives clinic. Semmelweis couldn't work out why, so he looked at the difference between the two wards. Firstly, he thought that it was the position in which women gave birth in, which was different across the two wards. However, when it was changed, so women gave birth in exactly the same position across the two wards, it made no difference to the death rate. Then he thought it was the priest who every time a woman died, he walked by ringing his bell, and he thought that it literally scared the women to death. So he stopped the priest doing this, but the women still died. Then he learned one of his colleagues, a pathologist, had died after pricking his finger during an autopsy of one of the women. 
the pathologist displayed all the same signs and symptoms that the women did before they died. And he came to the conclusion that puerperal sepsis was something that other people could get, not just women. So after more deliberation and investigation, Semmelweis found, found out the doctors were doing autopsies on the dead women, but the midwives weren't. So Semmelweis hypothesised that there were little pieces of corpse that the medical students were getting on their hands from the cadavers that they were dissecting. And then when they delivered the babies, these particles would go inside the women who would go on to develop the sepsis. So Semmelweis ordered the medical staff to start cleaning their hands and instruments in a chlorine solution. Now, the, the germ theory of disease wasn't around then. He didn't know anything about germs, but he thought the chlorine would probably mask the smell of the small bits of corpse on the doctors and the, and the medical students' hands. And consequently, the rate of childbed fever dropped dramatically. And Vanessa, it's such a wonderful story. I mean, it's sad, but amazing the leap that this took in medicine. It is worth pointing out for those people who don't know that they weren't using gloves at this stage. They were simply going from patient to patient, examining them in labour without washing their hands or wearing gloves between patients. Yes, and they were going from their autopsies straight into the maternity ward and delivering babies without... Yes, indeed. Yeah. So you'd think that Semmelweis would be a hero, but of course, sorry, uh, Peter Ann, the doctors thought, the doctors took offence to his suggestion that they were the ones giving the women childbed, fe childbed fever. And also because Semmelweis was so vocal, he publicly berated people who disagreed with him. As a result, the doctors stopped washing their hands and Semmelweis lost his job. Semmelweis got angrier as time went on and there was speculation that he went mad, possibly from syphilis or Alzheimer's, but he was committed to a mental asylum and uh, the literature says that he was probably bashed um, and ironically, he died of sepsis, the disease he was trying to prevent. Next slide, please. And over to you, Andrea. So thanks for that, Vanessa. So first, let's debunk some misconceptions. Drinking alcohol does not prevent you, uh, protect you against COVID-19, despite what Mr. Murphy's special offer of the week is. Spraying your whole body with alcohol will not kill the virus on the inside, but hand sanitizer containing alcohol will kill the virus when it's on your hands. So the next thing we need to know is how to protect ourselves and our families. This next slide, please. This picture represents a basic infection control principle, infection principle, uh, basic infection control principle, the chain of infection. The chain of infection shows us how an infection can travel from one person to another, and it also shows us how we can stop it. Transmission of a uh, infection requires at least three elements the infectious agent, a way to travel, and a susceptible host. Let's break this down. First, we have our infectious agents. Well, in this case, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. That is the virus that causes COVID-19. So, Andrea, just to be clear, we're looking up at the top blue circle at the top there, your infectious agents, and in this case, we're thinking about this as the coronavirus, the virus. novel coronavirus. Yes, Thank we you. are. So the next, uh, the next bubble down, we've got the reservoir. This is the place where the infectious agent can live. This virus in particular can live in people and on surfaces that have been contaminated by someone who is carrying COVID-19. So how does the virus get out of our body? This is called the portal of exit. We cough, we sneeze and splutter and sometimes spit and the virus comes out. So the mode of trans, uh, transmission is then how the virus gets around, how it travels. We could look at this like a mass transport hub with planes, trains and automobiles, a virus superhighway. This virus travels wrapped in droplets. The droplets are re released from our body when we cough, sneeze, splutter or spit and other breathe, people can breathe them in or touch something that the droplets have landed on, as Vanessa said. An average cough sends droplets about a metre. So picture, picture yourself now where you're sitting in your house, 
what would these droplets land on? The chain of infection also explains the portal of entry. And as its title implies, this is how the virus gets into our bodies. We breathe it in through the respiratory tract or we get the virus on our hands, then touch our eyes, nose or mouth. Then lastly is the susceptible host. That's you and me. This virus is not picky. It does not discriminate. And as Vanessa explained before, it's novel. So no one's had any contact with it before. As I mentioned, transmission requires the agent, a way to move and a susceptible host. So one of our aims of what infection prevention is about is to remove the opportunity for the virus to move from one place to another. Next slide. So in Australia at the moment, we're doing some really good things to make sure that the virus doesn't move. So social distancing, isolation, respiratory etiquette, cleaning and hand hygiene, just to name a few. So can we use these skills at home? Next slide. Sure, consider this. You've been out and about, you arrive home, you think to yourself, how do I keep the outside of uh, outside out so my house and my home stays COVID free within? It starts at the front door. Interrupting the chain of events can start here with cleaning your hands, either with soap and water or hand sanitizer. That means the virus is not getting a free ride. I have sanitizer at my front door, which means that everyone, yes, I mean everyone, has to use it on the way in, including me. Shoes can also be left outside. So now our hands are clean, what else do we need to do to stop the virus? Doing a two-step. No, not the dance, but the clean. Cleaning, as we know, is the removal of germs and dirt from surfaces. It does not kill germs, but by removing them, it lowers their numbers and the risk of spreading infection. And then our second step is to disinfect. Disinfecting is using chemicals to kill germs on surfaces. This process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove germs, but by killing germs on a surface after cleaning, it can further lower the risk of spreading infection. So frequently touched surfaces in your house or wherever you have just coughed onto are the things that need to be cleaned and disinfected. Think of things that you touch all the time, like uh, doorknobs, fridges, counters, light switches, phones, TV remotes, laptops, computer keyboards, and the list goes on. Now, before anyone asks how to do a two-step on a mobile phone, here is the latest guidelines. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for all cleaning and disinfecting products. Consider use of wipeable covers for electronics. If no manufacturer guidance is available, consider the use of alcohol-based wipes or sprays containing 70% alcohol to disinfect touch screens and make sure you dry the surface thoroughly to avoid pooling of liquids, which we know is fatal for these sorts of um, uh, for this sort of equipment. Now, if we just had clean hands to start with, then we might not have to do all of that. We have talked about stopping the virus coming in. So let's talk about what can come into our house. Everyday life can enter your home. Car keys, school bags, handbags, shopping bags, as long as you keep your hands clean and do the two steps. As for people, this week in Queensland, we can have two visitors per household coming into our house. So please note, per household, this does not mean if you have a family of five that you get to invite two friends each, because 10 friends, well, that always equals a party. Next slide. So just before we go there, can I just um, summarise that, Andrea, so I'm quite sure I understand. What you're saying is that the most important thing is you wash your hands as you enter the house. And that can be with hand sanitizer or with ordinary soap and water. You then also should disinfect things that are high touch points. So for example, it could be your keys or your wallet or your phone or things that have been, uh, that you've brought into the house with you. What about shopping? Okay, now I'll just go back to your wallet and your keys. Yeah. Unless you are putting that on a bench um, in a supermarket, 
if it's staying in your bag and you're just getting it out, do some hand hygiene before you get your stuff out of your bag. Um, I know, well, I have a hand hygiene product in my car. I have one in my bag. I have one at the front of my house. Um, I, and both, both the cars that I drive in have it. So as soon as I get into the car, I clean my hands before I even touch the steering wheel. So by doing that, you are removing some of those germs. Um, and that's as, really important. As for your shopping, as for your shopping the cardboard doesn't... Um, well, things that are in cardboard don't hold the virus very well. Um, Vanessa's talked about that. And plastic, the same thing. But if you wash your hands often in your house, when you get home from shopping um, and don't touch your face, then you're, um, you're pretty safe. I don't think there needs to be um, a, a containment system. For, for outside stuff. Thank you. So next slide. Oh, sorry, we're there. Vulnerable people. So the next thing we'd like to cover while we're in the home is living with a vulnerable person. So who is this vulnerable person? Well, as we've discussed, none of us have been in contact with this virus before. So we are all vulnerable to the virus, virus but some are more vulnerable than others. This includes older adults, people over 65, and Indigenous people over 50. And then people of any age who have a serious underlying medical condition like heart disease, chronic respiratory di disease, or diabetes, to name a few. People who live in shared accommodation or have shared meeting spaces, jails, nursing homes, aged care facilities, and dormitories. These people, um, apart from jails, because I can't really do anything about staying at home, but stay at home as much as possible. Wash your hands often, keep space between yourself and others, and avoid close contact with those that are sick. These are great ways to protect yourself if you're vulnerable. Having a plan if you get sick is extremely important. This should include having a care plan that contains your current health conditions, medications, emergency contacts, healthcare providers, and any advanced directives or power of attorneys. If you have to go to hospital, this will also mean that you need someone to water your plants, collect your mail, and look after your pets. So having this plan already in your head or written down somewhere is a great thing. Next slide. Before we go to the next slide, Andrew, could we just circle back briefly to the question of disinfection? There's a question that comes up, which I think I know the answer to, but is doesn't a disinfected surface become immune um, and and sort of for how long would it remain immune for? And my, what I understand from the virus is that unless someone then coughs on it or, or in, brings virus in, it's done, it's clean. Once you've cleaned it, you've cleaned. It's, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And in the hospital system, they use a, uh, they've been using a chlorine based um, disinfectant and you leave that on for two minutes before you dry it off. So this actually really kills germs. Would that be the same for our ordinary spray and wipe and GIF and whatever that we use, our ordinary household products? Okay, so household products, you need to look at the label and see whether it says uh, will kill viruses <laughs> because a lot of them will kill a bacteria and I've seen some great signs around, you know, get this treatment done, it, it kills bacteria, but we don't know whether that kills a virus. So you really need to do your research and find products that do kill viruses. Thank you. Okay, so children, I'm ducking into the ch children because children are going back to school and are starting to get their lives back. But... I guess we'll let them in the house. So not only can children be infected with COVID-19, but they can also feel the mental stress of the changing world they're seeing and feeling. They need to know that it's okay to be sad and worried, but not for long periods of time. Some signs of stress in children can include excessive worry or sadness, unhealthy sleeping or eating pa patterns, difficulty with attention or concentration and clinginess. Next slide. 
Using positive age appropriate language and concepts to explain what is happening is a good thing. There are so many resources out there that, you, uh, that can help you to have a conversation that aren't scary or negative, to guide and inspire you with pictures, play, stories and songs. Showing your children that you are listening to their concerns and they are important, that together you are going through something that you as a parent have never been through before. But in the end, you know, the earth keeps spinning and the sun will keep rising. So at this time, more than ever, it is important to keep their minds healthy, limit their exposure to news coverage, build your new normal, your new routine, because children really are creatures of habit. Giving children a sense of being in control is important. Ask them to be involved in the family plans. Make sure they keep in contact with friends and families via phone, FaceTime, WhatsApp, Skype, Zoom. There are so many ways, even writing a letter. It is important to keep their bodies virus free. Being a good role model for hand washing and respiratory hygiene is a great way to teach your children to do the same. Using paint to show them how to get into all the nooks and crannies on their hands when washing them is messy but fun. Clean their high touch surfaces and wash toys as you need to, as this will also help to keep them safe. Next and, slide. Andrew, before we go to the next slide, and this is such a fascinating one, could you just explain to people what you mean by using paint? Uh, because I think that's such a, such a lovely exercise to do. Or Vegemite, um, I think we spoke about, didn't we? Yeah. So with children, um, some poster paint, red paint, and you get, you put it on their hands like soap. And you say to them, okay, wash your hands for me. So they wash their hands and they do what they do. And then you go, okay, let's have a look at your hands. And you'll see where the red paint didn't go. And they're the bits they've missed when they've washed their hands. So it's a really visual um, tool for kids who, who like those sort of games anyway. So you can make a real thing of it, you know. Oh, you've missed one whole finger there. That's the finger you use on the remote control. So making a game out of it, making it fun for these kids. Um, and as, as I said, being a good role model. That's how we Thank can you. help our kids. The two things we've got, we're going back to the wicked question of which cleaning products to use, Andrew. We, we've got questions on this and we're going to have to put this to bed. Okay. So household cleaning products, let's say hospital grade, people are asking, does that mean that's sufficient to use? Good question. Vanessa, what do you, what would your view be? Um, I think you look at to see how much, uh, if it's got chlorine in it. So if it's a chlorine based hospital grade uh, cleaner, then yes, it's suitable to use. That would be my bottom, you know, line. Because we're aware that the marketing that says kills 99.9% .9 of germs or whatever. Um, so my, my understanding is that our good quality household products, like, and I don't need to push any particular product, but you know, our spray and wipe and our things that have got chlorine or particularly bleach in them. If you use that and then a warm cloth, that, that, this is not a very robust virus. It's a simple envelope virus and it will, it will be knocked dead by that. that. That's your understanding as infection control nurses, is it? Yes, so this, um, this virus is a particularly fragile virus. So it doesn't take much to, to kill. Um, and yes, yeah, so any sort of chlorine bleach-based bleach household cleaner uh, will most likely do the trick. Thank you. And just then before we move on from this, just a reminder to people that next week uh, we are going to have a Kids and COVID special webinar where we'll... Andrew, we will spend a bit more time on this, won't we, talking about kids and, and how to keep them well and the impact of COVID on them, both physically as well as mentally. Yeah. So thank you. Do keep going. Next slide, please. So using respiratory hygiene, the dab is great. It's a great move when you've got no tissues, just do the dab. And kids love that sort of thing. So um, that's that's a way to help them have fun with this. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, so it seems garlic doesn't protect you against COVID-19 either. Okay, next we'll go back to Vanessa, who's going to talk to us about the sick person at home. Thanks, Vanessa.
Thanks, Andrea. So there are people being cared for at home who do have uh, or who have tested positive for COVID-19. So if you're in that household, the first thing to do is don't panic and follow some simple yet effective infection prevention and control methods, which we've been talking about through this presentation. Now, just be reassured that if your home isn't suitable to care for somebody who is positive for COVID-19, then that person will be cared for uh, in a health facility. So you don't need to worry, um, you know, if you don't have space, things like that. All you need to do is say, look, really, I've got a household full of vulnerable people. We've only got one toilet, one bathroom. Um, we don't have a spare bedroom and that person will stay, at, stay in the health facility. So first thing to do is don't panic. So there must be a separate bedroom and government recommendations are that for an infected person to be cared for at home, they must have a separate bedroom where they can be isolated from the rest of the household. Of course, many households may have a separate bedroom, but not a separate bathroom. And in these circumstances, whether a person gets cared for at home, uh, comes back to who else lives in the house and how many people live in that house. Meals can be left outside the door and when finished, dirty dishes can be placed outside the door by the infected person um, to be taken away. So think of it as like home-based uh, room service. Samantha, can I ask you, would, the, would your recommendation be that when you pick up that cutlery and crockery, you should wear gloves? Yes, it is. And I'm about to talk about that. Yes. Yeah. And um, the other thing is about the air conditioning. So if the room air conditioning is on or it is required, uh, open, your, open the bedroom window about two and a half centimetres because most air conditioners uh, recirculate room air. They don't actually bring fresh, fresh air in and they don't... Um, you know, take the air from the inside out. So to actually replenish the air in the room, just open the air, open the window just a little bit so you can get some fresh air in and out. Second thing is the household mustn't have any vulnerable people living in it. Um, and Andrew's talked about vulnerable people because vulnerable people are at risk of get, developing more serious complications uh, should they get the virus. Third thing is that designated crockery, cutlery, drinking cups, glasses, all that sort of stuff um, should be labelled in some way. And nail polish is a really good substance to use because it's quite a, you know, as, an, as you know, it's like an enamel. Um, so if you can put a dot on the, uh, the, the, the infected person's knives, forks, plates, glasses, cups, things like that, um, then you know which plate and, and cutlery belongs to them. Then these can be washed separately to other dining utensils um, in, in hot water and detergent or separately in the dishwasher. Remember the survival times on plastics and stainless steel peaks at about eight hours. Uh, so if you can wash the virus down the drain with the detergent and hot water, the likelihood of any leftover living virus on these washed items is pretty minimal. Then the sink can be washed afterwards and the crockery and cutlery can be stored in a plastic tub with a lid separate to other items. Towels and bed linen can be washed using a hot wash in the washing machine separate from other family members' items and either hung out in the line or using a hot cycle and tumble dryer. The washing machine can then be put through a quick empty cycle with a laundry detergent to ensure any leftover suds or water from the previous cycle is washed away. The other thing is that other people in the household must be able to access PPE um, with gloves and masks being the minimum. So obviously when washing the dishes, there's a risk of splash. And also when piling the laundry into the washing machine, you tend to get up close and personal with the dirty linen. So the person delivering and collecting the meals, washing the dishes and doing the laundry should be wearing uh, a mask and disposable gloves at a minimum. Now to protect clothing, a plastic apron, such as something you would do cooking with, or an overshirt that protects arms and your body, um, can also be used and then thrown into the washing machine as well. And the plastic apron can be wipe, wiped over with a household detergent. The other Vanessa, thing, Vanessa, sorry. Could we, could we stay on this topic for a moment? Because I think it's really important and, and people are interested in it. Obviously, we've been very lucky so far 
in that we haven't had a lot of community con transmission either in Australia, but particularly in Queensland, in our parts of Queensland, which is wonderful, which is not to say that it's not coming and there will be potentially outbreaks and hotspots and so on. So two questions. The one is that it's impossible to get masks if you are an ordinary person and or if you if you try and order them and so on, we may not be sure whether we're getting the right kind of mask. So could you just give a little bit of explanation about what kind of mask someone might use? And if you can't get a surgical mask, what might be an alternative, please? Okay, so the theory behind the masks is that for the person who is infected, that the mask, if the person coughs or sneezes, the mask will prevent that uh, virus particle and that bit of spit, to, to, want, to, to put in a better term, uh, projecting out. So it stops the person infected. For the person who is uh, not infected, the, 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 the thinking behind the mask is that that prevents splash coming in. So the types of mask that uh, is required needs to be impermeable but breathable. Now that's a little bit difficult to explain. So surgical masks, for example, which are the masks that you see uh, surgeons wearing on, you know, ER or on a, showing my ages in a, one of those hospital shows um, where they're tied up around the back of the neck. They're specifically designed so that they are uh, impermeable to uh, fluids, but yet they're still breathable. And that's what's required. There's, Lots of masks out there uh, that uh, are being used. Um, and I, I do talk a little bit about this a bit further on, but the important thing about the mask is that it needs to be fine enough to prevent fluid going through either way. So I've seen people wrap scarves around their, like layers of scarves around their their faces particularly when they're like you see it on tv when they're evacuating you know waiting for a plane to, to fly back to australia and things like that and i guess realistically um if that's all you've got that's all you've got and you'll do the best case scenario as to to um to, to try and prevent transmission but what i guess the most useless masks you see are those paper thin ones that you only need to breathe on and suddenly the paper becomes wet because the theory behind these masks is that once they get wet so if a person's breathe in and out for long enough and it, and surgical masks they're saying you know two to four hours and they're no use anyway so even in, in a carefully crafted surgical mask after two hours the moisture content is such that they no longer prevent any any viral transmission so you want to be really careful about the masks that you buy they need to be um they need to be certified in some way that they are either um where have you bought them um you know ce certified tga certified things like that or they need to be pretty thick and i know there's a lot of people making masks they need to be thick enough that they will survive uh, at least uh, an hour if you're going outside and I'll talk a little bit more about this that once they become moist you, you do need to take them off and wash them and dry them yeah it, it's a it's a bit of a difficult issue the masks yes thank you and I know you come back to that later but I imagine that if we get a, a situation where we do have COVID positive people being looked after at home because they're not terribly ill that they will have access to the proper PPE because that'll come via public health and the local health facility. That's correct. Yes. Thank yes. you. So whilst we're on PPE, the other thing with PPE is that the person who has the virus shouldn't be a prisoner in their own home. And if the house has its own backyard, the person should be able to get out, get into the sunshine and get some fresh air. But to do this, if they're walking through the house, they must wear a mask uh, when walking through. Um, and when they're outside, sit outside in a designated part of the yard, if, uh, particularly if there's other people in the house, so that they can actually sit outside and enjoy themselves, but be separate from other people. 
And the question is, should they wear a mask when they're outside? Well, I guess that depends on if their family members out in the yard, obviously well away from the sick person. And, and, a, and a scenario would be um, a parent with, with children. You know, the children are paying, playing at one end of the yard, the parents sitting at the other, other end of the yard. Um, so they can actually see their kids play and, and the kids can see that the, the parent is actually okay. And, that, and that's really, really important. So if there's people out in the yard, yes, but if they're out in the yard, if someone's out in their backyard, enjoying the sunshine, um, I, you know, just take that mask off for a bit and just enjoy the fact that you're not wearing it. Obviously, if the person's coughing or sneezing, then yes, wear a mask. Uh, the other thing in the house, cleaning of high touch surfaces in the infected room should be done daily and preferably by the infected person. So if your partner is not good at house, housework, this is the time to <laughs> teach them. Using a household detergent, as we've discussed, in a bucket of water, surfaces, as we've talked about, phones, tablets, remote controls, all that sort of stuff, should be done at the end of the day uh, with a freshly made bucket of detergent and water each day. And I say the end of the day because then you've got eight hours of sleep time for that viral load and that virus to die off um, after you've washed the surface. If they are unable to do this for whatever reason, then a designated person in the household should do this whilst wearing mask, gloves and a protective gown. If protective eyewear is available, such as safety glasses, um, and you're working in a wet area, so such as let's say that uh, there are two people in the household and you're sharing the bathroom and someone else needs to clean that bathroom for you, so there's a bit of splash possibility, then I would wear protective eyewear as well. Finally, those remaining in the house with the infected person need to be isolated as they are a close contact of a confirmed case. This means they must stay at home, not leave the house for any reason, not even a quick trip to the local store, not even a quick run around the block for exercise. And certainly your local public health unit will advise you of this. Next slide, please. Vanessa, I beg your pardon. <laughs> yeah, no, you're just going to summarise. Just a couple of questions if I could give them to you. Sure. Uh, tell us about sharing of headphones and earphones. What do you reckon? Oh, look, you know, the virus is transmitted um, most likely by by um, mucous membrane, like as we've talked about. So expectorating any sort of uh, respiratory secretions and then breathing that in. You know what? I'd go out and buy a separate set of headphones. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, <laughs> it was I'm me personally. On <laughs> and, then, and then a couple of other questions, if that's okay. Yeah. If someone's washing machine goes to 40 degrees, that's the hottest it gets. Is that hot enough to kill the virus? Look, 40 degrees isn't very hot. Um, you know, when we think of our body temperature, we run at 37 degrees and people who are unwell with the virus will go 38 to 40 degrees and it doesn't kill the virus. So 48, 40 degrees won't kill the virus, but it's about the detergent that you use. It's about um, washing the virus down the drain. And you've, that's the way you've got to think about it. So, you know, with this two-step, um, you know, people talk about a two-step cleaning process. The first, the first really, really important step in any cleaning and disinfecting process is the washing part, which is the first step. So you've got to think that by putting things in the washing machine, um, you're actually literally washing the virus down the drain. Therefore, you dis you're decreasing the amount of virus on that, that, that product that you've got in the washing machine for a start. So, you know, it, it will be reduced a huge amount just by washing it down the drain. Then if you hang it out to dry or you put it in the hot, um, if you've got a tumble dryer and you put it in a hot cycle, then you're then doing a further thing to decrease that viral load in that product. Um, and then if you leave it somewhere for, you know, 24 hours, the chances of that product having a virus on it, uh, particularly clothing, uh, would be very, very minimal. And I suspect particularly if you hang it on a line in our lovely sun Queensland sunshine and a bit of wind uh, and dry it like that, that's also very helpful, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And here's the, the question I thought was going to come up is, is will the sun kill the virus? <laughs> um, well, look, um, I think if you left something out in the, if you left something 
that had the virus on are out in the sun for three days as virus would die a natural death anyway, whether the sun actually contributes to that, we're not 100% sure yet. Uh, there is studies going on with UV lights and whether, um, particularly in lower middle income countries like our Western Pacific countries who are very poor on PPE, um, they're looking at if you put a, a mask that's been used out in the sun for um, or, or under a UV light for, you know, 24 to 48 hours, can you use it? Uh, we still don't know. Thank you. Okay, so how can you keep safe when you're out and about? And this is really going to be a lesson in PPE, not touching everything you see, social distancing and hand hygiene. The first rule of thumb is if you don't want to catch it or you you don't want to give it away, then just don't go out. History tells us by that by isolating people in commun isolating people, communities or towns, the spread of disease can be stopped. We have no tools in our shed to combat novel coronaviruses. We've got no immunity, we've got no vaccine, so stay at home. And there's a couple of very famous cases, um, including the town of Gunnison in Colorado, who did not allow anyone to enter their town during the Spanish flu in 1918. And as a result, not one person in the town got the flu. Unlike Philadelphia and Baltimore, who on the other hand were very reluctant to close uh, down events, and they were the hardest hit. And even around the times of the plague, around in 1530, um, one of the, the, the many public health measures besides picking up collection, collecting uh, the bodies of plague victims um, and to bury them in mass graves were things like, this sounds a bit, we're not suggesting this, but they would hang people who wandered in from an infected area into a non-infected region to stop them bringing that. I feel that's a bit, a bit going over the top there. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the classic public health approach. Here. No, no, I know. I know. Um, but they also, they also isolated people, uh, plague victims in their homes to, to make sure that they didn't spread it as well. And that's how Henry VIII happened to escape the plague as well. Um, Rule number two, if you're going to wear PPE, do it properly because PPE, such as masks and gloves, can be dangerous if it's not worn correctly. Um, and it's, it's dangerous if it pe means people don't wash their hands. So we've talked about masks already and the current recommendations are that you wear them if you're sick, um, which really means you shouldn't be going out. Um, and as I said, realistically, the current surgical masks may only have a life of two to four hours. But what masks do do is that they remind you not to touch your nose and mouth. Um, and they may be also effective in preventing those large droplets entering your nose and mouth should you walk past a person who has a virus at exactly the same time that they cough or sneeze. If a mask is going to be worn, particularly the surgical types where they've got a little thing you can pinch over your nose, is that it must be worn over the nose and mouth, not just the mouth. And for it to fit properly, um, it should fit snugly over the bridge of the nose and up under the chin. And if it, if it fits firmly, when you breathe in and out, you should actually see it slightly sucking in and out, which means that it's got a reasonably good seal. Gloves. Now, they're my biggest bugbear both as an infection control nurse uh, in healthcare and during the pandemic. Gloves can be a big portal of transmission for the virus. If you go back to Bunnings, once again, the packet of screws, if the person buying the infected packet of screws is wearing gloves, they, they take the screws home after removing their gloves in an incorrect manner and infecting their hands whilst doing so. Then they get home, they open the packet of screws without the gloves, without washing their hands and without disinfecting the packet of screws. Then there's no difference in transmission as if they weren't wearing gloves. So to wear gloves, you must learn when and how to don and doff, which is taking off your gloves in such a way that you don't infect your hands. And then undertake hand hygiene straight away, either with hand sanitizer or soap and water that you must disinfect all the things you've touched with the gloves because your gloves have touched everything in the store. And research into glove wearing for infection control purposes show that people will wash their hands more if they don't wear gloves. What I've also seen is people wearing gloves whilst loading their shopping into the car and then driving with their gloves on. So now they've infected the inside of the car. 
if the gloves had not been worn and they'd sanitised their hands after loading the car and before driving off, the inside of the car would be far better off. Rule number three, basically don't touch things. There's ne no better time to go with the old saying, look with your eyes and not with your hands. Pick up something only if you intend to buy it. Rule number four, practice social distancing. Remember back to the beginning and how far that droplets can travel before gravity take holds? Keep that 1.5 metres. And rule number five, wash your hands. Washing with soap and water is the gold standard for infection prevention and control, but always have a bottle of TGA approved hand sanitizer if you can get your hands on some, um, on hand, <laughs> as soap and water is not always available. Some of you have may heard about the five moments of hand hygiene in healthcare. Well, if you're out and about, you could consider the five moments of hand hygiene like this. Do your hand hygiene before you enter a shop. This protects everyone else. Do your hand hygiene after you exit the shop. This prevents, this protects yourself. Do your hand hygiene before or, not, or upon entering your house. This protects yourself and your family. Do your hand hygiene before preparing food and eating. And do your hand hygiene after going to the toilet, after blowing your nose or after coming to coming into contact with your own or other people's body fluids, such as your kids. Vanessa, thank you. I really like that refresh of the five moments of hand hygiene. Could We've had a couple of questions come through and I'm very aware of the time. If you wouldn't mind just if you and or Andrea could uh, answer this. Someone has asked about the role of ordinary soap. As you know, it's quite, it has been very hard to get hand sanitizer or to get hand sanitizer with 70% ethanol. Um, my understanding is that good old ordinary soap and warm water is very, very good for hand washing. Is that correct? I see you nodding away. Yes, it is very correct. And without wanting to get into the science of it, we have two types of uh, microorganisms or, on our hands. One is our own and the other is other people, so such as the virus. And simple hand washing with soap and water gets rid of the other. So whether it's bacteria, viruses, it's what you've picked up in the environment and it washes it down the drain. And that's why we say washing with soap and water is the gold standard because you're getting rid of the bacteria and the viruses that you've picked up in your daily activities and you're washing them down the drain. Thank you. And a second related question uh, is about cleaning kitchen surfaces or wiping surfaces. The person says, um, should we, if, can we use a cloth, a, a, dis, a dishwashing cloth to clean and then you wash the dishcloth regularly or would you recommend disinfectant wipes? You know, those, those ones you can get. Yeah. I would recommend, and this is, uh, this is an environmental take on it as well. I would recommend paper towels. Um, so if you've got, uh, you know, a, a, um, a bottle of, a, say a, a household disinfectant that's got a chlorine base, I would use that with paper towels. Then you throw your paper towels out, which are of course biodegradable. Um, and then you don't have to worry about what you're going to do with that cloth. I, I'm, I'm a really against uh, the dishcloth because things like bacteria and viruses love wet, moist, warm environments. Um, so if you're going to use a cloth, you would have to wash it every time that you you, that you wipe the bench. Thank you. That's very clear. We've also had a question come in, and Andrea, this I think you spoke about this earlier. Um, this person would like to ask about shoes and walking around the house. Is the recommendation is as you come to house, you wash your hands, you pop your shoes off before you walk into the house or at the front door? Uh, yeah, I would do that. Um, with shoes, unless you are crawling around on the floor, you're not, not actually going to be picking up what the shoes bring into the house. The only time that that would happen is if you had children who played on the floor and then you would have to be um, careful and do some extra mopping during the day if people were coming in and out of your house. But um, for, the, for the adult, um, you're not hopping on the floor. So I don't see well, don't, it don't judge risk. Andrea maybe there's lots of hopping going on at the time. and someone has said my kids almost eat off the floor look I'm very aware of the time and there are, there, there are lots of questions to ask here but 
um, what I was going to do before we wrap up and talk about next week, which is when we do talk about kids and COVID, is a 30 second bite from each of you. Top tip for keeping your home as safe as possible. Vanessa, let's start with you. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I would uh, look, and I think Andrew is going to say the same thing. Um, cleaning, keeping your surfaces clean, particularly your high touch surfaces, uh, washing your hands regularly at all the appropriate moments. Um, and if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got uh, things in the house that are the high touch, such as, as a kid's toys and things like that, put them in the washing machine at the end of every day um, and yeah, and, and keep them clean. That's the, that's, yeah. Thank you. Andrea? Um, I'm going to say ditto on all of that because I'm, again, a great believer in keeping your hands and your surfaces clean. And I think if you keep your hands clean as the bare minimum, then you uh, are decreasing your risk for this virus immensely. Thank you so much. We'll just look at the next slide, if that's all right. And that just tells us about what's happening next week. We've got two very well-known paediatricians who are going to talk about kids and COVID. And this is particularly relevant with, the ch with some children going back to school next week and trying, and trying to manage that. Um, and I would like to thank Vanessa and Andrew very much for those of you who've got time, if you could just fill in a feedback for us that you'll get after this. And I hope you all have a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.